Good morning. I greet you with the words of the Apostle Jude. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. This morning we draw near to God who has revealed Himself to us. He has revealed Himself to us through what He has made. He has revealed Himself to us. And He's revealed Himself to us ultimately through His Son, Jesus Christ, who makes our worship possible. And so to the end that we would worship God rightly, we begin with a reading from God's Word. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow them, follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I, take it, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is God's Word. And because God has revealed Himself to us as the good and great shepherd, we can praise Him. So we're going to sing now a hymn of adoration, a hymn of praise. Would you stand and sing? Lord 
سیدن بود Great Shepherd, we recognize like Peter did, as we saw in Sunday school this morning, when we see God and His holiness, we recognize our sinfulness. And so we cry out to Him in prayer, thanking God for the salvation that has come to us through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our blessed Redeemer, we praise you because you are our prophet, our priest, and our king. You are our good shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness. But Lord, we all like sheep have gone astray. Father, you have laid upon our good shepherd the iniquity of us all. All our sins are placed upon him because he has laid down his life for his sheep. But Father, he laid down his life that he might take it up again. And for that, we praise you. You. Because our good shepherd is the risen shepherd, we know that he protects us against all predators. He has all authority, so help us to listen to his voice. Help us to obey his command. Would you bring more sheep into your fold even this day, we pray. It's in the name of our great shepherd and savior we pray. Amen. As we sing this next song, uh, it may might be new to you. Um, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain most of you know the text, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Um, but the tune we're going to use this morning uh, is from a familiar Christmas hymn, uh, which is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And the text of this song can easily, easily relate to that uh, Christmas hymn. Christ came on Christmas to be our Redeemer. He suffered, bled, and died. And, but as He rose, He brought us to from death to life. So let's stand together and sing this wonderful hymn, I Will Sing of My Redeemer.
sung of his sacrifice, he paid the debt and made us free. Uh, we can be reminded how we, through that, we can approach him with our needs. And he is, and through that pardon, we can approach him boldly. So as we sing this next song, we've been singing it for the past few weeks, before the throne of God above, uh, let us approach the throne of God with boldness. sharing as they're uh, moving off the stage. You're going to be sharing a song with us this morning. Uh, speak, O Lord. And as the text uh, to this song goes, Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. I hope that speaks to you this morning.
God's Word and turn to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 1. For those of you who weren't here with us last week, we began a study going through the book of Titus, and we saw a couple of important things. One is that the theme of the book of Titus is truth that accords with godliness, truth that produces God's good works in us. And we saw that this means that for the Christian life, it doesn't mean that truth is just head knowledge that has no effect on us. We could be filled up with all sorts of doctrine, but if it doesn't produce godliness, godliness in us, then we're missing something. But we also saw that we can't just seek to produce this godliness in and of ourselves. We can't seek just to do good works on our own, because without God's truth in us, this godliness will not come. We're just seeking to be better people, and we can't do that apart from Christ. And so, knowing that this theme, truth that accords with godliness, is going to continually pop up in the book of Titus, we come today to the next section, verses 5 through 9. And so Paul offers up as the first example of what does it look like for truth to accord with godliness, for the gospel to produce godliness in us. The first example of that is the pastor, is the elder. And so we're going to get the text before us. The title of the sermon is Exemplary Elders. And for that, we turn to Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. And whether in body or in spirit, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must reproach. He must not be arrogant, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain." 
but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. God in heaven, now that we have heard your word, we submit to its instructions. Help us now, Father, to focus on the text's exposition. Would you fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might understand your word? Would you soften our hearts that we may delight in you? Would you sharpen our minds that we may discern your truth? And would you shape our wills that we may desire your ways? It's in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And for his glory we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now I want to go ahead and just address the question that I'm sure some of you are thinking. Why in the world are we going through a list of qualifications for a pastor when we just called a pastor? I understand the, the confusion you might feel because normally we only turn to these passages when we're looking for a pastor. But you've got one. And so this is one of the benefits of going through a book of the Bible. We will take everything as it comes up. We don't skip over anything because if all of God's Word is God-breathed, if all of it is sufficient, if all of it is good for us, then that means we're going to look at every bit of it. So we're going to continue going through the book of Titus and we're going to see why does it matter. Not just for me. It's important that I know what God expects of me, and it's important that you know what God expects of me. But that's not the only benefit that we get from this word. And so I, I pray you pay attention and hang on, and I, I think you'll see there is benefit here, even though uh, you're not calling a pastor. Praise God. So as we begin, we look at this passage, Exemplary Elders. We see the importance of appointing a pastor. Because you see, Paul begins, he says in verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So Paul begins here with the, the point that godly leadership is essential in a church. He says, This is why I left you in Crete. We don't know when exactly Paul went to the little island of Crete. It's only mentioned just momentarily in the book of Acts, in Acts 27. That doesn't seem to be the time that Paul went there uh, because it, they were just passing through on a ship. It doesn't seem like he would have had time to conduct a ministry there. But we know at some point Paul had a ministry, even if for a brief time, on the island of Crete. But Paul could not do everything that needed to be done. As the saying goes, Rome was not built in a day, neither is a church built in a day. And so Paul left Titus there for this particular purpose. He says that you might put what remained into order. Now this word uh, in the Greek is a medical term. It means to set a broken bone. It's where we get the idea of an orthopedic to set broken bones or an orthodontic to set broken teeth. This is the, the medical image that Paul is giving to Titus that he's going to have to set the broken bones to make things right. It's a painful process, but it must be done in order that the church might heal and the church might grow. Even as he says at the end of this passage in verse 9 that the pastor must give instruction in sound doctrine. That word is also a medical word that we get hygiene from. And so he's connecting here at the beginning and the end this medical imagery that it's a painful process, but Titus must set the broken bones so that they can have a whole, healthy, sound church. And so this is Titus's command that this is what he's to do, to put what remained into order. And the first example of doing that, the, the chief example that he gives is to appoint elders in every town as I, Paul, directed you. All right, so we, we've got to deal with this word elders. Some Baptist churches use that almost exclusively. Other Baptist churches use it, use it almost not at all. It's a word for a pastor. The Bible gives us multiple words for a pastor. The pastor is an elder. The pastor is an overseer. We're going to see that later in the passage. Most of us generally just say pastor. But these are all one office with different terms. They're not an office of pastor and an office of overseer and an office of elder. Some churches believe that. I don't believe that's what the Bible teaches. There's one office and it's the pastor. 
And you can call him the elder. You can call him the bishop. You can call him the overseer. You can call him the elder. These all mean the same thing. They give you a, a different emphasis to tell you what this office holds, what the person who's in this office is supposed to do. So here Paul uses the word elder, and so that's the word that we'll use. Uh, and originally it just meant an older man. An elder was someone who was older. And because they were older, you gave deference to them. You looked to them for wisdom. You sought out their wise counsel. But eventually in the church it came to be uh, associated with this office of pastor. It doesn't mean that every pastor has to be an old man. I'm thankful for that. I wouldn't be ready for it. But in this sense of the word, I am an elder, even at my age. And so Paul is emphasizing here that this is the first step. This is what he's supposed to do, for Titus is supposed to do here on this island of Crete. Now notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, Titus, you know, Crete is a really pagan culture. They don't know much about God, so we probably don't need to come on too strong. Maybe we just need to do a little bit of, uh, of catering to their felt needs. Maybe we just need to indulge a little bit of their tendencies to, to continue on in paganism, to continue on in their idolatry, and maybe just mix them together. He doesn't say, Titus, you know, people, they're just not used to the gospel. We probably should just entertain them for a little bit and slowly but surely just wean them off of what they're coming from and slowly give them the gospel. That's not what he says at all. When Paul tells Titus to begin this ministry here, he says you begin with godly leadership in the church. And what is the reason for that we're going to see is because the godly leader must be able to teach the word. He must be able to feed the sheep and protect the sheep. That is the beginning and end of Paul's ministry when he says the word is what is center. The word is what matters. And so for that Paul tells Titus to begin with godly leadership because it's absolutely essential. So, if godly leadership is essential, who can be this leader? Who can be this exemplary elder? Well, here in verses 6, 7, and 8, and 9, he gives he gives characteristics. He tells us what does it look like to have an exemplary elder. We see here, repeated in verses 6 and 7, one phrase, above reproach. He says in verse 6, for if anyone is above reproach. He says again in verse 7, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. So I believe Paul is organizing his thoughts under these categories, and both of them are above reproach. The exemplary elder must be above reproach reproach in his home. And the exemplary elder must be above reproach in his character. And so Paul begins here in verse 6. He says, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So an exemplary elder, the model pastor, is to be above reproach in his home. What does it mean to be above reproach? Does it mean that the world will never say anything bad about you at all? No. Even as, as the culture here in America seems to be becoming increasingly antagonistic toward Christianity, there's times when churches are going to be accused of things, that Christians are going to be accused of things, and pastors are going to be accused of things. It doesn't mean that no one will ever say anything about you, but it means that it's not true, that it won't hold up under examination. The way my mentor explained it to me, he says, it doesn't mean that they're not going to throw mud at you. It just means that it won't stick. Like, like mud that's got too watery and you throw it against the wall, it just falls right down. It won't stick because there's nothing there for it to hold on to. It's not true. The elder, the pastor, must be above reproach. First in his home. It says the husband of one wife. Now immediately we jump to this and we assume, okay, that means he's not divorced. Check and move on. But I, I believe the verse means a lot more than that. It's talking about more than just that. Some people would say, well, look, they're in a pagan culture. They had people who had multiple wives. They were polygamists. And so what he's emphasizing here is that the pastor must not be a polygamist. He must be faithful. He must literally, the text says, be a one-woman man. So he just doesn't need to be a polygamist. He needs to be uh, married only to one wife. And so you can check that box and move on. But again, I think Paul is saying much more than that. He's saying that the pastor must be faithful to his wife. I've seen many pastors who could check those boxes. They can say, well, I'm not divorced. They can say, well, I'm only married to one wife. I'm not a polygamist. And they could check those boxes and move on. But they weren't being faithful to their wife. Whether they were hooked on pornography, whether they had a lustful heart, or whether they just had a mistress known as the church. 
and they neglected their wife. There have been many pastors who were not the husband of one wife. They were not faithful to their wife. And so Paul packs a lot here in this controversial phrase. It's not used very often, and so it's kind of hard to understand sometimes. But I believe that's what he's emphasizing here, is that the pastor must be above reproach in his home. That looks like, first, he must be faithful to his wife. But furthermore, it also says that his children are to be believers. And if you have those ESV journals, you might see the footnote down there that it could be translated, or his children are faithful. Again, this is a, a little bit of a hard phrase to understand. Because if he's saying that the pastor's children must be believers, we well, have a problem. Because no man can force his child to be a believer, even if he's the pastor. And so that's a problem if it's saying that to have a faithful pastor, his children must be believers. What if they're too young? What if they're out of the house? What if there's all these variables beyond your control? But I believe what he's saying is just as the pastor must be faithful to his wife, his children must be faithful to him. He says that his children are faithful or believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now this word debauchery is not one that we use very often anymore, but if you'll remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, that, there's a related word that shows up there when it says that the prodigal son took all that his father had given him and he went and took it and spent it in riotous living, is the way the King James says it. And we look at that passage and we see that the prodigal son had given himself over to pleasure. He wasn't just seeking just to have a good life, he was seeking to put his pleasure, his self, above all. And that's what it looks like here, to this idea of debauchery. And so it seems to me to carry this idea of adult children. Adult children uh, should not be open to the charge of debauchery. They shouldn't uh, be living a lifestyle like this. But when it comes to your younger children, they should not be open to the charge of insubordination. Children who are still at home open to this idea of, of having a lack of respect for authority. See, this is important because if children can uh, respect the authority in their home, then that means they can't rightfully respect the authority of God. And if children can't rightfully respect the authority at home, and they can't right really rightfully respect the authority of God, then what's going to happen to them when they get out into the world and they realize, oh my goodness, we're all people under authority. Even if you don't have a job, if you're retired, even if you do pretty much what you want to do, uh, just try going 100 miles an hour down this highway here, and you'll be reminded that we're all subject to authority. And so Paul is teaching here that the, the pastor is to be above reproach in his home. He's to be faithful to his wife, and his children are to be faithful to him. Paul makes it clear the reason why for this in his letters to Timothy when he says that a man must manage his household well. Because if he can't manage his household well, then how can he manage the household of God? How can a man faithfully love and lead his bride? How can he fail in that area and be expected to faithfully love and lead Christ's bride, the church? So a man who is to be called to this high office of elder, he must be above reproach in the home. But furthermore, he's got to be above reproach in his character. So he continues here in verses 7 and 8, and he gives first these negative characteristics, the thing that the, the elder, the pastor, is to avoid. And then in verse 8, he's to give the things that the pastor, the elder, is to aspire to. And so here in verse uh, 7, he says, For at an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. So again, Paul gives us that heading that the, the pastor is to be above reproach. But he calls him, not this time he doesn't say elder, he says overseer. Now again, I believe this is an interchangeable word pointing to the office of pastor. But this word overseer literally is where we get the idea of bishop. And so that's why some churches, some denominations have bishops. That's where they're getting this idea from. But again, I believe that it's all the same office, not separate offices. And he says for an overseer or a bishop is God's steward. Now this is an idea that again Paul uses throughout his letters the idea of uh, the pastor, of, of Christian being the steward of the mysteries of God, of the gospel of God. This word steward is another word for servant. Remember we saw the word servant uh, last week in the introduction when Paul introduced himself. He began the letter saying, Paul, a servant of God. But this is not the same word. This time he's giving a different picture, a different idea. And he says here that the overseer, the pastor, the 
elder is God's steward. The steward in, in their time would have been uh, the servant, the slave in the house who managed the household. The person who owned everything was far too busy doing other stuff, and so they left someone in charge. And that steward was responsible for all things in the house. He had to manage the household well. Everything that belonged to the master, it was his responsibility to steward. It was his responsibility to make sure that it was used well, that things were invested well, that everything got a good return. And so we see that in Jesus' parables. He talked often about uh, giving parables of stewards and to much who has been, if you've been given much, to much will you also be required. And you have the parable of the faithful stewards, the ones who were given different amounts of money, and they were told, you must manage this well. And the one who didn't manage it well, even though he still had that investment, he had not managed it, and so he was punished for this. So it's this idea that the pastor is God's steward. He has this responsibility from God. He's been entrusted with the good deposit of the gospel, as Paul says in Timothy's letter. And since he's been entrusted with this good deposit, he must manage it well. And so the pastor as overseer, as God's steward, again, must be above reproach. And then Paul gives these negative characteristics. He says he must not be arrogant. He must not be quick-tempered. He must not be a drunkard. He must not be violent. He must not be greedy for gain. Now these all seem to be pretty straightforward, and yet they hit at some of the most tempting areas in all of life. There are temptations for the pastor, and there are temptations for you. Temptations toward pride, toward temper, toward alcohol, toward power, and money. These are common temptations. All of us have to deal with these, and yet the pastor... ...not be arrogant seeking to get his way over everyone else's way. His job is to be seeking God's way, to be seeking God's will. So the pastor must not be arrogant. He must not be quick-tempered. I don't know if you realize this, but you get lots of different opinions thrown at you as pastor. And if you're someone who is quick-tempered, that's going to come back to bite you. You're going to hurt the sheep. Because as Christ has called us to be his under-shepherd, we're to care for the sheep. And so the pastor must not be quick-tempered, or he will definitely hurt the sheep. The pastor is not to be a drunkard. Over and over throughout Scripture, the Old Testament and the New, it's very clear that Christians and pastors especially are not to be drunkards. But it also gives us the counsel of saying wine and alcohol is a dangerous substance altogether around. And it must be used very carefully, usually in medicinal purposes. It's not to be used loosely because once you've taken the first drink, how do you know how far you are on your way to being a drunkard? And so if we're not to be a drunkard, wisdom would require that we stay away from it altogether. The pastor must not be a drunkard. He must not be violent. He must not be seeking to get his way, his will, by force. Again, he is working for Christ. He is Christ's steward. And so Christ is building his church. Christ will get his work done the way he wants to. And so the pastor must not be violent. But he also must not be greedy for gain. There are people who enter the ministry seeking for a good living. They're seeking to be comfortable in their way of life, and they're seeking to get a good salary. But that's not what the pastor's heart is to be. The pastor, the elder, is not to be greedy for gain. These are the negative characteristics of a, a pastor, of an elder. These are what the pastor, the elder, is supposed to abstain. to be other things. He's supposed to be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Again, these seem straightforward, but let's walk through them quickly. The pastor, the elder, is supposed to be hospitable. It literally means a lover of strangers. They're supposed to care for others. We don't just push people away because we don't know them and we don't know what they want and we're, we're afraid of them. We're supposed to be hospitable, always managing God's household well, seeking to bless others and to lead them to Christ. But just as the pastor is to be a lover of strangers, literally, he's also to be a lover of good. That's important, because we run right by that sometimes. We think, well, as long as I'm doing what's right, as long as I'm externally doing the right thing, then that's what matters. 
But Paul says here he's to love what is good. This is a matter of our affections, a matter of our heart. This is something we could camp out on for a long time because it's an idea that usually escapes us. We think about the external, but God is shaping us, conforming us to the image of Christ to make us more like Him, to, that we would be lovers of good. More than that, the pastor is to be self-controlled, not controlled by his desires, not controlled by his sins, but in control of his capabilities so that he could be a faithful steward above reproach. He's to be upright, holy, and disciplined. This word here for holy is not what we think of when Christ has saved us and sanctified us. He's set us apart. He's made us holy. That's what God has done on our behalf. But this use of the word holy is talking about how we are to live. That we're to be devoted to Christ as we're seeking to abide in Him. As we've talked about as our first priority, this is what is to characterize the exemplary elder. It's what to characterize the faithful pastor. So he's told us that the pastor must be above reproach in the home. And the pastor is to be above reproach in his character, avoiding certain things and aspiring to certain things. But now we've seen what he must be. Now we need to know what he must do. What is the exemplary elder, the faithful pastor to do? Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. In ancient times, they would keep these lists. You had these virtue lists. We see them in different places throughout the New Testament. And if they wanted to emphasize something, you'd either put it at the beginning or you'd put it at the end. Here, Paul has saved his emphasis to the end. We've seen what the elder, the pastor, the overseer is to be, but now we know what he must do. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word. He must hold tight. He must be faithful to the faithful word. Even as he is faithful in the home, even as he is faithful in his character, the faithful pastor must be faithful to the faithful word. That's what trustworthy word literally means. He's faithful to the faithful word as taught. Notice that little part, as taught. The pastor is not just making it up. He's not just pulling it out of nowhere. As Jude says, we have a faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints. And we're going on now 2,000 years of church history where we're not doing this on our own. We can look back at our family of faith and we can see how people handled these texts and handled these difficulties of living the Christian life in the 3rd century and in the 7th century and in the 12th century. And on down to our day, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses and we have received the trustworthy word as taught. Ultimately, we look to the Scriptures because it's been handed to us through Christ and through His apostles. As we saw last week that Paul is an apostle of Christ and we have the apostle's testimony here in Scripture. But we're not alone in this. We can look to, to the last 2,000 years of church history to understand what these texts mean and what it looks like to live the faithful life in any time and in any place. So the faithful pastor, the exemplary elder, is to hold firm, to hang on to that trustworthy word. He's to guard the good deposit, as Paul says in his letters to Timothy. But what is he, why is he supposed to do that? Why is it important that he hold firm to the trustworthy word? He's got these two responsibilities. He must feed the sheep and he must protect the sheep. It says there in the second part of verse 9, so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine. The faithful pastor, the exemplary elder, is to hold firm to the Word so that he can give instruction in sound doctrine. Again, we're seeing what we've learned in the beginning, this theme of truth that accords with godliness. The faithful pastor must be able to hold fast to God's Word so that he can teach, so that he can give instruction in sound doctrine. Again, as I mentioned, that word means healthy doctrine, whole doctrine, doctrine that brings us uh, to be complete in Christ. He's to feed the sheep. Again, the emphasis is that God's Word is prioritized over all in the church. God's Word is sufficient and God's Word is supreme. The faithful pastor must feed the sheep. 
but he must also protect the sheep. The verse ends by saying, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That's not a part of pastoral ministry that we like to think about. That's probably not the part of ministry that you were thinking about when you called your pastor. It's not something that was emphasized a great deal in seminary because it's not something we like to think about. Yet over and over and over in God's Word, we're told that just as Christ is the Good Shepherd and just as Christ protects us from the wolves, so is the faithful pastor also to be able to rebuke those who contradict the trustworthy Word. The pastor must be able to not only feed the sheep, but to protect the sheep. This is what it looks like to be an exemplary elder, a faithful pastor. And as we have already mentioned multiple times, that this idea of faith that leads to good works, or that doctrine that leads to devotion, the gospel leading to godliness in our lives, the first example that Paul gives is the pastor. It's the elder. But we're going to see that he's going to continue. Next week we'll see that an example of why it's so important to rebuke those who contradict the trustworthy word. Because he's got a whole passage devoted to that. It was a serious problem in the church in Crete. But then in chapter 2, Paul is going to work through the different groups in the church. The older men, and the younger men, and the older women, even the servants, and even say, this is what it looks like for the gospel to lead to godliness in your life. And Paul points again to Titus and says, Titus, you're to be the example of this. Pastor, you're to be an example of this. But he connects it with the work of God. Because in case you haven't noticed, if you haven't gathered this in your Christian life, the pastor will let you down. The pastor will fail you. But Paul points over and over to not just looking toward the pastor. The pastor is to be the example of the gospel leading to godliness, but it's all connected to the work of Christ on our behalf. Because in chapter 2, verse 10, he says that the, uh, the, all the groups in the church are to be showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Again, he's back to that idea of teaching the doctrine of God our Savior. He reminds us, even as that theme of the gospel leading to godliness comes up over and over in the book, so does this idea that it is all because of Christ, because God is our Savior, because God has sent Christ to save us. And so as we look through this list of, of qualifications for the pastor, did you notice that there's only one that is unique to the pastor? It's the ability to teach, that he must hold firm to the trustworthy word. That's unique to the office of pastor. Everything else in that list is for all Christians. There's nothing in there that you can look at and say, Whew, I'm glad that's just for the pastor and I don't have to worry about that. Every bit of that list is repeated over and over throughout Scripture in different places. This is what all Christians should aspire to. This is what all Christians should expect of themselves. But it's essential in the life of the pastor. The pastor has to have these qualities. And yet recognizing that as the under-shepherd, he will fail. And he's always to be pointing us to the one and true good shepherd, the faithful shepherd, who will never fail, who will enable us, who will allow us to grow in godliness so that these things can be said not just of your pastor, but of you. That's our goal, that's our hope, is that all of these things would characterize not just the pastor, but each of us. So that's my prayer for us even this day. If you're here today and you recognize this list and you say, oh my goodness, there's a whole lot of this list that characterizes me and I don't like it. If you recognize that you have sinned against the Holy God and that your sins separate you from God, I plead with you today to repent of your sins, to trust Christ, to love Christ above all. But for the rest of us who are walking with Christ, many of you still areas of my life where I want to grow in faith. And godliness towards Christ. Today is the day to recommit yourself to Christ, to do that. To turn to Christ saying, Christ, I forsake all other things that separate me from you, that I want to be like these words on this page. May that be true of each of us. We're going to have a moment of silence now where we can pray before God. We can humble our hearts and we can say, God, some of these things don't characterize me, but I want them to. God, would you help me through the power of Christ, through the power of your Spirit, would you make me more like your Son, Jesus Christ?
We're going to have a moment of silence so that we can pray, and then we're all going to stand and sing a hymn of response, trusting that those words in the song are the words of our heart toward God, and that's how we will respond to Him. So let's pause in silence, and then I will pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We're thankful that even as this is a passage that we would not normally turn to except under certain circumstances, we're thankful that your word is sufficient. It is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it speaks to us even this day. Lord, I know that in my own life, and I trust that in the life of each of us here, we see areas that we need to grow, that we need to rely on your spirit, that we need to be more like Christ, who is the good shepherd, the faithful shepherd, the faithful pastor. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be more conformed to the, son, the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, this day. And for those who are here who don't trust Christ as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. That today would be the day they would repent of their sins and trust Christ as Savior. May it be so in your church this day. Amen. Let's stand together and sing, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
As we prepare to go out into this week, I want to give you just a few announcements of how we can respond to our God and serve Him. If you're here today and you're a visitor, we are so glad that you're here. And we have visitors' cards in the back on the table that you're welcome to fill out and drop in the offering plate there in the back so that we can have a record of your visit and to know how we can better serve and pray for you. Uh, mentioning the offering plates, if you haven't already done it on the way in, remember that even though we're not passing the plate, we are taking up an offering. And so you have that privilege of, of giving your gifts back to God there in the back. And because this is the fifth Sunday, not only are we taking up our regular offering, we're also taking up a benevolence offering. So that, that all the money that you've designated towards benevolence, that we will take that and put it into our benevolence fund so that as we go throughout the week and people come here by the church and we see needs out in the community, ways that we can be of service to share Christ's love, um, that would help us to be able to do that. Um, also, I wanted to give you an update that we did our food bags on yesterday, on Saturday, and because of, of the work of, of so many people here at the church and your generosity, we were able to help 77 different individuals. Uh, that would be members of, of households and individuals on their own, 77 people who were, who were blessed because of the work of this church. And so I want to thank you for all of you who participate in that, all of you who give to make that possible. It was a joy to be able to see people, and I pray that God would continue to grow that ministry. Um, we see lots of different people coming through, and we're able to pray with them. We're able to invite them here to church if they don't have a church home. And so it's a wonderful opportunity. I pray you would uh, continue to support that and encourage that, and I'm thankful for it. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention, as you probably know, tomorrow is the first day of February. So if you're looking for your Bible reading plan, that means that tomorrow's a new month. And so those papers are in the back on the table there. We've also uploaded it on the website. So if we run out of copies or you just don't want to take a paper today, you can look on the website. It's all there for you. And I, this is, we're going to see what happens when I forget to follow up on everything. Linda, are you still willing to, out, so many of you have given me encouragement and let me know um, what a blessing it is as you're reading through this Bible plan. And so I didn't want to keep all that encouragement to myself. I wanted to share some of it with you. So, uh, Justin, someone, there you are. Can you take a handheld mic to Linda McCoy? And Linda is going to tell you how the Bible reading plan has been an encouragement to her. Because I want you to hear what the, the good things that I get to hear from people. Um, I had mentioned to Pastor Charles this week how much I was enjoying the Bible study. And I'll be the first to admit I'm really weak at uh, sitting down every day and following the older plan that we used to use. But when I started this one, I started about two weeks late, so I sat down and just kind of caught it all up. And I'm like, man, I really love the way it pulls it together. Rather than just going straight through, it's weaving the story and helping me get a better grasp on, on, a, on a theme of that. So I personally have enjoyed it very much much and has made me much more committed in my Bible reading and then um, with the uh, video he's doing midweek um, I like that too because then a lot of times I'll read several days ahead but it's kind of pulls it together and it helps me reinforce what I've read so if you're not doing it I encourage you to take a few minutes and try it I like the fact that it's five instead of seven so if I do because I do still work um, it gives me a little I don't feel as pressed and it gives me a little catch-up time to uh, mediate and study on it and I like the video because then it, like I said, it re reinforces what I've read and helps me for the things that I'm missing. And then Fred's my backup when I don't, when I miss something. I'm like, now, why did this happen? <laughs> He's a lot better at that. But um, I just encourage you to take. Pastor's taken a lot of time to devote to um, time to make those videos, and uh, they are very good and helpful. So I just encourage you to and help support our church, and it'll help each of us in our relationship with the Lord too. Thank you so much. I wanted y'all to hear some of the encouragement that I give. If you have a different Bible reading plan that you're doing and you're faithful to that, please don't feel obligated to, to participate in this. But if you want to, if you're looking for some encouragement, I, I trust that it's helpful. Again, as she mentioned, it's five days instead of seven, and so that gives you a little wiggle room. If you, if you miss a day, you get behind. And for those of you who do enjoy looking at things on the Internet, we post uh, videos to our Facebook page, but we also have follow that link and you can see just short little videos. I promise I do make short videos and so that you can have just a snippet uh, to help try to tie these passages together as we read through the great narrative of God's Word. So I hope that's a blessing to you. Um, Justin is going to lead us in the doxology as we prepare to go out into this week. Remember uh, just out of an abundance of caution with COVID, we're trying to congregate uh, not in the foyer, not in the entryway but on out. And I see that it looks like still it's still raining. So I may speak to you quickly as I'm standing out there in the rain, but I do want to encourage you to not congregate, just to keep on moving, and uh, God will keep us safe. So, thank you for being here.
and, and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.